As we mentioned earlier, the CZU August Lightning Complex fire is now at 57,000 acres and is 2% contained. John Palmentary has been in the Santa Cruz Hills. He joins us live, and John, residents are hearing of the losses and pleading for more help before other communities are lost. And residents came down out of these hills with signs and a plea for help earlier today. They know California has many massive wildfires burning right now, but they were expecting to see more firefighters up in their communities trying to save their homes. Swanton is gone. What a tragedy. Last chance is gone and Cal Fire couldn't do anything because there were not enough people on the ground. Emotions have been running hot in Bonnie Dune in the Santa Cruz Hills. Displaced residents taking a stand at a roadblock, keeping them from their homes in the eye of a fierce fire. We are here to for a bit an urgent plea to Governor Newsom to release more resources for the fires that are raging in the mountain communities above Santa Cruz. All we ask is that we commit as many resources as we can. Um, there are people, there's, there's still a lot of structures that can be saved. Um, we've lost our home. It's completely burned to the ground. This fire's scary. Um, and I think that one thing we can do to protect Santa Cruz and protect San Lorenzo Valley is to get the resources up here that we need. We went to the incident command team with their message that they respect the firefighters, but they're frustrated about the widespread losses. Typically in an area that size, we would have probably 10, 20 times the resources to combat that fire. We simply don't have it. The number of fires throughout the state, uh, we're really tapped out. We're bringing in stuff from out of state. That, that, should indicate that how how far drawn down we are with resources and the frontline fight continues where fire crews can take a stand here in the hills above UC Santa Cruz. There are numerous spot fires like this, but without driving winds, firefighters say they can handle this. It's conducive to their plan. Residents who have raced from their homes took some pictures of what they saw on their streets as they left, not knowing how much, if anything, would still be standing when this is over. I thought I lost all my worldly possessions when I tried to defend my property as long as I could and I ran out of water pressure and in long story short, I drove out through flames. And already there are ongoing signs that this will be a long haul to put this fire out and fix the burnt power lines and other infrastructure. And the incident commanders are telling us that the aircraft that fly on this fire are having a difficult time hitting their targets or even getting through the smoke. So they're hoping for some clearing so they can be more aggressive from the sky. The firefighters on the ground, as we all know in California, are battle tested. They know how to take on these fires and they need this kind of weather, calm winds in order to start building up those very vital containment lines. Reporting live in the Santa Cruz foothills this evening, I'm News Channel reporter John Palmentary. Oh, it was horrible. Just horrible. I took a lot of pictures and I almost thought last night I was going to lose my home for the first time. An area loaded with 30 year old vegetation off Painted Cave Road above Highway 154 is now wiped out of its vegetation. About 2.30 in the morning, the canyon erupted with erratic winds and it had fire burning on many fronts as part of the larger cave fire. It was a high risk spot to be in. We were among those in the mix that had only one way out. With the winds calming down and the fire running out of fuel in many areas, 10 planes and nine helicopters were able to focus on hot spots and lines of defense. It was an aggressive day of work to create a box around the fire. Painted cave residents told to evacuate did not heed the warning. I was in my gear at the time and I just said that I'm staying for now. We just walked the street actually and so I could help point out who was gone already, who was staying, who need help. Um, and I think that helps kind of establish a little trust with them. There's just no way I'll leave my property. What if the fire department says you've got to go? I have never left and that they take my name down and my driver's license and I've always stayed. I've been through many fires. This community is well organized and has planned for fires for years. 
We were on radios with one another, so we had several different lookouts around the community, and we were up all night just walking the community. We were running hose out wherever we could. Yeah. Um, as you can see, we have different pumps and water systems, so we were ready. Nearby, the historic painted cave with Native American drawings on the rock walls has been sealed off and protected by firefighters. It's a state historic park and a treasured archaeological site. Good evening, everybody. I'm CJ Ward. We begin at 6 o'clock tonight with the final report into the Conception dive boat fire that killed 34 people off our coast more than a year ago. The National Transportation Safety Board came down hard this morning on the owners of the boat and the Coast Guard. Senior reporter John Palminteri joins us live. And John, the NTSB cited where lives could have been saved. Truth Aquatics, which owns the Conception boat, has been described over the years as a good operator with no big complaints over the years, even after Coast Guard inspections as well. But the NTSB report shows that safety protocols were not followed that could have prevented the 34 deaths. The focus should be on that conditions were present that allowed the fire to go undetected and to grow to a point where it prevented an evacuation. The National Transportation Safety Board came down hard on the operators of the Santa Barbara based Conception dive boat, Truth Aquatics, and the United States Coast Guard for many conditions that it said led to the death of a crew member and 33 passengers in September of last year. The early morning fire occurred in waters off Santa Cruz Island, and the remaining five crew members could not save any one in peril. For months, a preliminary investigation and interviews focused on the cluster of chargers and power strips in use as a possible cause, but that could not officially be determined. Not having a roving deck watchman awake all night as required was said to be a violation. That person could have likely spotted the fire early on, and there was frustration over a pattern of enforcement. Board member Jennifer Hammondy called a tombstone mentality. We've asked the Coast Guard to take action, or we've asked operators to take action, and unfortunately, uh, in the operator's case, it doesn't happen until after the fact. And in the Coast Guard, apparently, we need to ask five or six times. Having inadequate working alarms on the vessel was also upsetting. It's amazing that we have an unattended room that has battery chargers on it, a flat top griddle, two burners, refrigerators, and we have no regulations that require a smoke detector in there. Just amazing. The vessel had two lower deck escape routes, a stairwell and an escape hatch that went to the same area where the fire was. The hatch was criticized for being inadequate in an emergency. I'm 5'4". I'm not, I'm not a big person. You know, I had to flip on my back and push the escape hatch up. Another NTSB uh, staffer, Eric Strickland was with me. He's a foot taller than me. It's not an easy, easy to escape area. The board said the Coast Guard did not do enough inspections at night to see if vessels had someone on watch and other safety management protocols were not implemented in a timely way. The Congress mandated that 10 years ago, the NTSB recommended it eight years ago. It's past time to act. There's already been legal action linked to this fatal fire. And one thing we learned today, because of that legal action taking place over the last several months, the National Transportation Safety Board, as part of their investigation, could not get some of the crew members to completely complete the investigation and tell all of their story. That was held back by the legal investigation that's going on on the criminal side. Reporting live at the Santa Barbara Harbor this evening, I'm News Channel reporter John Palmentary. That's the sound people at Positano Apartments heard after Santa Barbara police tried to serve a high-risk warrant. Heard the shots, saw them, you know, coming off of the, the building. Yes, you know, we dug down and just got out of there. Dude, what the f is happening? What is all this? they evacuated residents. Well, we're actually trying to get out of here right now. The car is in the back parking lot. They locked down San Marcos High School across the street and closed a stretch of the 101 freeway temporarily. We were under the impression that the suspect was armed with a rifle that could possibly reach the freeway and we did not want to have anyone injured on the freeway. With the help of a robot, they determined the gunman was dead on the second floor of the townhouse. 
The sheriff's department is now taking the lead in the investigation. This lasted for you know, several hours. It was definitely, uh, as you could see, very uh, concerning for everybody. They had the apartment taped off as people arrived home from work. I felt, I felt scared. She says, I felt scared because this is a place that's very secure and this has never happened here before. Residents say the gunman had served time in prison and didn't always live there. Just talked about the cold, wet, wet months are here and coming even more. Homeless numbers are growing in Isla Vista. News Channel 3 senior reporter John Palmentary joins us now live. And John, you've seen these concerns up close. The timing is right for a new shelter housing plan. With federal funding and local services, those who are living in parks in tents in Isla Vista, like this group behind me and other areas around here in Isla Vista, could soon be in more structured housing. And with that from there, possibly more permanent housing down the road. We wanted to share with you, are you aware of the blessings of showers that comes through? Making one-on-one -on -one contact with the Isla Vista homeless has helped to build relationships and eventually housing solutions. An action plan is in the works this week. We were out with Parks and Rec this morning and we started at Camino Cordo and moved our way over here, just checking in with the various um, people and uh, seeing what their needs are. We do outreach uh, every week. Santa Barbara County supervisors are hoping to use federal funds to start a temporary housing relocation project near the Isla Vista Community Center. It's not far from where 40 to 60 people are living in a park in tents and at times in dangerous conditions. I've run across a, a lot of drug paraphernalia out here. Ron Moomy has been cleaning up for more than a year here through a United Way program. He says the campsites have grown during the COVID conditions. It's got out of hand. I mean, it's, it's went o over the hill. The county has done an assessment of living like this, and they have found there are a number of health and safety concerns, along with fire hazards. That's why you don't see kids playing here anymore. The parents don't feel comfortable letting the kids play in the park because they don't know what's what. The proposal to the Board of Supervisors would involve a supervised shelter or temporary housing relocation program for six months. I would say for the most part, they're very responsive. Um, uh, most of them are very um, accepting of support. For Mumi, who lives in an RV loaned by his church, he's all in for any new housing option. Where do I sign the paperwork? You're ready to go. I'm ready. My wife is too. For those who are living here between government aid, like these donations of socks and snacks from AmeriCorps, and help from the students who go to UC Santa Barbara nearby, they see ongoing generosity. And the... Um, Students are very, uh, they have an open heart, you know, uh, this generation uh, compared to when I was in school in the 80s, it's completely different. They have empathy and they will bring clothing. Now this uh, tent city here is next to the Embarcadero Hall off of Embarcadero del Norte near the top of the loop and the preferred location for the new small structures, it would be temporary, about six months, would be just nearby by the Isla Vista Community Center. It's a story we'll follow very closely if this goes through and those structures start going up very soon. Reporting live from Isla Vista this evening, I'm John Palmentary, News Channel 3.